Welcome, welcome, welcome all. If you can mute uh, your mic, uh, we are blessed. It is a plum pleasing pleasure to have the Reverend Anthony Justin Modder in the 21st century, century Rogers with us uh, today. And uh, we are blessed. He has done apologetic work. He's all over YouTube. Uh, he's worked with David Wood, who's also a huge apologist. Uh, and, and if you've listened to Pastor Rogers speak, you know that you are in the presence of, of, of giftedness, of brilliance, of passion for the Lord. And it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. And then when you hear his testimony, that just make it's like you hadn't been a, you didn't grow up a, pro, a child prodigy studying uh, in some uh, monastery. So we are here with Pastor Roger. He's graced us. We also have uh, the director of Reasonable Faith. Uh, Ron Woodruff is with us. Uh, I'm, I represent Reasonable Faith Dallas, and we have uh, several other people on the line who are listening. And we're going to turn it right over to Pastor Rogers. He's going to pre present tonight on Christ in the Old Testament or however, whatever he wants to title it. But that, that'll be the uh, subject matter. And I'm going to put myself on mute and uh, Pastor Rogers, you have you have the mic. All right. Thank you so much. It's great to be with all of you. I haven't thought a whole lot about the specifics of what I'm going to say tonight, but it's a topic I love, a topic I talk about a lot, something I've written on, something I, I debate with non-Christians. In fact, really, it's marked the entirety of my Christian life, this, this particular subject, and not to the exclusion of other things. So I'm, I'm quite comfortable with this, but my background was mentioned. Now, I'm not going to go into my testimony here, but I do want to say at least this much because it, it kind of gives you an idea of, of how I got into all of this and how I sort of discovered the importance of this and why it continued to fuel uh, my passion and, and all of these things. So I was born and raised in Southern California. I was raised uh, in the context of gang life. And so fell in with gangs when I was young and eventually landed in jail and prison when I was 18 years old. So that was back in 1993. So almost 30 years ago, I was released two and a half, three years after that. So I didn't stay in for very long. I was arrested for stealing a car, uh, but it was there in prison that I heard the gospel of Christ. I uh, actually was in a cell with a self-professed devil worshiper. And here's a uh, remarkable account of God's providence. This devil worshiper, I had expressed no interest in reading the Bible. You know, I'm just in a prison cell and uh, the guy says he's a devil worshiper. And we started getting into discussions and he was telling me things about the Bible. And I said, that doesn't sound feasible to me. And he said, I'll tell you how to get a Bible. And he did. And I put in a kite, which is a way of requesting things. And I got a Bible. He couldn't show me what he was claiming. But now I had a Bible on my hands and a lot of time on my hands. So I started reading it just for entertainment, just to pass the time. While I read it, I came to a conviction of my sins. I was utterly terrified. I read of a God who had power over all things and I was wrathful towards sinners. He destroyed the world, uh, spared only eight people. Uh, and, and you know the rest of the story. In all of that, I didn't catch the good news. I didn't hear... I, you know, and it's not any fault of the Bibles. I of the Bible. I was deaf and dumb to all of that. And you know, even though you know, I mentioned the story of Noah, God uh, sparing Noah and his family. One of the things it says is Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And yet, I glossed right over that. Just read right past it and only heard about God deluging, you know, uh, the wicked. Uh, but uh, eventually, I heard a preacher. You know, Paul says. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I heard a preacher, finally understood the gospel, repented, believed, and have never looked back. And that also just changed my entire, uh, I mean, everything. It just changed everything. Prior to that, I had read two books in my life, and now I'm surrounded by a you know personal library of 5,000 books. I 
have had no greater interest than putting my money in that direction. I, you know, I don't have any other, uh, there's nothing wrong with having hobbies and other things. This is just the, the only thing I've really had any interest in, in spending my money on. And uh, so, the, but the reason I bring all of that up is because I was reading the Bible and had very little interaction with Christians from the outside. I did have some involvement. Like I mentioned, I, I was, uh, I heard the gospel from a Christian minister but I was spending a lot of time just reading my Bible, and I was surrounded in the prison by various groups. I came into contact with groups that I have not heard about since being in prison. I mean, there was everything under the sun in the prison. Uh, the, the normal stuff you'd expect, uh, Muslims, the Nation of Islam, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, all of that, but then Ekin Carr and just a variety of things, like I said, I, I haven't heard about since leaving there. But it was in that context that I kept hearing people speak against the Trinity and the deity of Christ. And I'm just a guy in his cell reading his Bible, and I'm looking and thinking, what are these people talking about? I see the Trinity all over the Bible. I see the deity of Christ all over the Bible. And sure, I didn't see everything at once, and but the, more and more as I'm reading it, things are jumping off the page at me. And you know, I, I even talked with, uh, there was a Jewish guy, he was actually agnostic, but raised Jewish that I would interact with. And he would talk to me about his upbringing, his knowledge of Judaism, Jewish customs. And I always found these discussions fascinating. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you one example of a discussion so you'll, can see, so you'll see why it was so fascinating to me. At, at one point, he was explaining to me how Jews practice a Seder service. Remember, this guy doesn't believe any of this, but he grew up with it. And I read the Old Testament, and, and some of the things I'm hearing explained in words, but not necessarily getting a visual. I'm not a very visual person. He's describing to me how they practice this Seder service. And as he's doing this, I was just mind blown. Uh, and, and part of what he was explaining was, and maybe you've all heard this, but uh, he said, one of the things we do is we take three meals of bread made without yeast, and then we take the middle one, we break it, we wrap it up in a napkin, we hide it away, and then the children go and find it and then come back rejoicing, saying, we found it, we found it. <laughs> and I'm hearing this, and I, I'm just, I, I'm, I, I'm amazed by it. And I said, what does that mean? Right? What does that mean to you? And he said to me, oh, it's just something we do. And I, I, I was startled. I thought, that's something you do. I said, that's something I believe. <laughs> I, I said, it sounds to me like you just described my very heartbeat. I mean, that's, that's what I believe as a Christian. It's what I live for. Uh, in other words, the gospel, the, the persons of the Godhead, uh, the second person being taken, broken, wrapped in burial cloths, laid in a tomb, later found by the women followers of Christ, come back to the disciples saying, we found, you know, the Lord is risen, all of that. Uh, and, and, and there's something remarkable about this when you press into it a little further. There's nothing about this practice in the Old Testament itself. This is something that develops in Judaism. And I'm not saying it, it had no uh, uh, moorings in the Old Testament. It's just, uh, it, it's kind of like, and don't take me for a geek here. I just remember hearing this before, but I uh, I heard that the uh, the creation of Superman, the, the comic book character, was actually the creation of two Jewish guys. And where they got their idea for this was they said, let's take a bunch of features from Old Testament characters and combine them and make this one grand character. And that's where they get Superman. So it's interesting when you look at the whole Superman idea that he's the son of Jor El, right? El is the word for God. So he's the son of El, right? He has, uh, uh, he's sent to this world. Uh, if you look at some of the movies, they've got these uh, interesting things. There's one of the versions of this has Superman at one point uh, sort of renewing his strength, going up into the sky and, and sort of getting energy from the sun. Uh, absorbing its rays, and then you, he hears the words of his father Jorel saying, "You know, they can be a good people if they want to be uh, Kalel. They just need somebody to s show them the way, and therefore I've sent them you, my only son." Right? Uh, and, and then in one of the versions, you have Superman being stabbed in the side by Lex Luthor with a kryptonite uh, dagger, 
and apparently dying, but then somebody removes the dagger and he eventually revives. Uh, but my, my, my point in bringing that up was not to get off into some comic book thing, but just to say it, it's very interesting to me that here's these Jewish people just trying to come up with this fantastic character, and they end up coming up with a story from the Old Testament that looks a lot, you know, there's some analogies there to Christianity. Well, you have something even more like that in something like the Seder service or other aspects of Judaism. And that sort of thing just is found all over the place in Judaism. And so this is the sort of stuff that I'm I'm hearing when I'm talking to this guy and I'm reading the Bible. And then I'm hearing all these people say the Trinity is not in the Bible. And of course, I'm hearing the Trinity was made up at Nicaea. Uh, and if that was easy to dismiss. I, I see it clearly in the New Testament. And I didn't have access to the writings of the early fathers to debunk the idea that it was taught by the fathers prior to Nicaea. Now I, now I have the fathers, have gone through the fathers, poured over the fathers, can tell you without equivocation, it's in the fathers. But uh, the, the other thing that, that I was struck with is it's not just in the New Testament, it's in the Old. And I, I'm seeing this in the Old Testament simultaneously with seeing in the New Testament that this is an assumption of the New Testament writers. So even before I get into the Old Testament, uh, w one of the things that's interesting, uh, and later I would read people like B.B. Warfield who would express this in a certain way that I like, uh, but I, I, I saw this idea b before, but, but he gave me some of the, the, the language to, to articulate this. But one of the things that Warfield mentioned, and he was a famous theologian at Princeton University or seminary back when it was still a bastion of Christian orthodoxy, but he says one of the things that's striking is how easily this belief in Christ's deity becomes part and parcel of the conviction of the apostles and the early Christians. So much so that when you're looking at all the controversies that Paul and the apostles are dealing with in the New Testament, the deity of Christ is not one of them. They're dealing with the Judaizers and this question of whether Gentiles can be included without circumcision. There's all this sort of thing going on, but there's not a debate about the deity of Christ uh, or uh, you know other things swirling about this question of the Trinity. In fact, Paul takes the deity of Christ as a given in order to argue for other things. And so as an example, you have Paul in Philippians 2. Remember in Philippians 2, Paul is exhorting the Philippians to esteem each uh, others as uh, you know greater than themselves, e even though they are alike human beings, image bearers, uh, and may even have some priority in terms of their uh, status uh, or, or what have you. He says to esteem others greater than yourself. And then he says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who, although existing in the form of God, he uses the participle who parkon, which means continuing to exist, right? Existing in the form of God, he did not consider the equality, this is the upshot of the Greek, he did not consider the equality that he had with God something to be used to his own advantage, but humbled himself, taking the form of a servant, and, and you know the rest of the text. But so it's interesting here. Paul is making a very strong statement about Christ's deity, but not to argue for it. He is assuming it and arguing from it. This is the foundation for Paul's exhortation to esteeming others greater than yourself. Look at, look at the example of Christ, equal to the Father, and yet humbled himself and did so for our sake, was exalted to the Father's right hand in our nature. There he represents us. We're all going to bow to him. And so this struck me, and I kept seeing this all across the New Testament, and I could give numerous examples of this. And by the way, I should also throw in here another interesting fact. It's certainly the case, and maybe you're already thinking this, that Jesus receives pushback from the religious leaders in the Gospels. But the pushback is not to this notion of a second or even a third person uh, in the Godhead. The pushback is that he's God. Right there, there's a dis distinct difference there, and, and so, for example, think of the high priest's question to Jesus in Mark 14. The high priest said to Jesus, "Are you the Christ, the Son of the Living God, and, or uh, 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 the, the Son of the Blessed One?" Is is how he puts it. Actually, uh, he uses a euphemism, and Jesus said, "I am," and you'll see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Notice that the high priest doesn't say, do you believe that God has a son? That's not his question. His question is, 
are you the son? Do you claim to be that one? So there, there's, there's not that question per se. And even if there were, there, there were different Jewish factions. So even, even that wouldn't be problematic. There are different Jewish groups. There are even Jewish groups that don't believe that man has a soul, that man exists uh, after death. So uh, just because one Jew, let's say, is questioning the existence of a distinct person wouldn't disprove that there is this concept, at least in first century Judaism. But in any case, the high priest doesn't seem to be part of that whole thing. He seems to be assuming the notion of a divine son. And he considers it blasphemy when Jesus says that he is that one. And so, uh, you know, that sort of thing continued to strike me. And But anyway, so as you go through the New Testament, you don't just have the apostles assuming already from the get-go that J this is who Jesus is and not having to really argue for this, not even against these Judaizers and others who are rising up in the church and, and complaining about these distinct things that Christianity introduces, which even there, this is anticipated in the Old Testament, right? The inclusion of the Gentiles. But, uh, you know, even with that, right, they're, they're pushing back against this, but they're not pushing back against Christ's inclusion in the Godhead. So, uh, but but there's there's not only that there's also the fact that when the, the the new testament writers will speak of christ's deity they point to the old testament they they actually think they can demonstrate it on the basis of the old testament think of hebrews chapter one in hebrews chapter one when the author of hebrews is and i mean the whole point of the book is that the, there are jews hebrews that's why it's called hebrews who are being tempted to go back to judaism and the assumption of the whole book, by the way, is that the temple's still standing. It makes no sense outside of that context, because you have to think of the Christians in the first century being persecuted, and Jesus has been proclaimed to be the fulfillment of everything, and yet they don't see all of this passed away. Uh, and so the question is, well, maybe he really wasn't the fulfillment. And so the author of Hebrews is arguing for the superiority of Jesus, right? The superiority of Christ's priesthood, superiority of Christ's sacrifice, the superiority of Christ in every way. And all he'd have to do if the temple and everything else had been destroyed already was simply say, look, guys, there's nothing to go back to. God wiped that thing off the map. It's no longer there. Forget about it, right? And in fact, remember what he says in Hebrews. He, he quotes Jeremiah's promise of a new covenant. And then he says, by speaking of a new covenant, he has uh, basically said that the old is obsolete, right? Not in Jeremiah's day, but in the day when that new covenant is established, the day Jeremiah is looking forward to. And then the author ends chapter 8 this way, verse 13. He says, what has been rendered obsolete is about to disappear. He's talking about the old covenant, the temple, its ministrations, the priesthood, the sacrifices, if all that was already gone, he could just say it's already disappeared, but he says it's about to disappear. And so, uh, anyways, what the author of Hebrews is doing is he's saying, don't go back to that. Jesus is superior to those things. He's the substance of which those things are just shadows. And by the way, you get that language. I was talking with Sean earlier. You get that language in Philo and others about uh, shadows and realities and so forth. But... Uh, uh, and, and in fact, it comes right out of the law. Uh, the author of Hebrews quotes the law saying that these that Moses received uh, the the instructions for the tabernacle. He received the pattern, a shadow, uh, you know, of what was to come. And uh, this, by the way, was the basis for Philo's belief. He's a first century Jew that there was a heavenly high priest corresponding to the earthly high priest. The earthly high priest was just a type and shadow of a heavenly reality, not simply a future reality, but an already existing heavenly reality. So there was someone in the heavens that course that the high priest corresponded to a mediator between God and man anyways. Um, but at the beginning of the book of Hebrews in chapter one, he cites one Old Testament text after another to establish the deity of the son to which of the angels did he ever say you are my son this day have I begotten you. Uh, he cites uh, Psalm 45, where he says, the father says about the son, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. He cites Psalm 102, where it says, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations uh, of the earth. The heavens are the work of your hands. They'll perish, but you remain, uh, and so forth. So he speaks of him as the Lord. In the Hebrew text, the term is the divine name, Yahweh. 
and he applies that to the sun, ascribes to him the creation of the universe, and ascribes to him immutability. They're going to perish, but you're going to stay, you're going to remain the same. And then he cites Psalm 110, a, a text that Jesus cites in his confrontation with the Jews. Psalm 110, where it says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Uh, you'll hopefully remember that text in Jesus' interchange with the religious leaders. Remember, the, the Jews come to Jesus and say, which is the greatest commandment of all? And Jesus cites the Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And they say, quite right. But what a lot of people miss is there's actually, this, this is uh, the, the uh, sort of the, the, the run-up. I mean, it's, it's, it's towards the end of a protracted debate. Okay, if you look at Mark 12 and uh, Matthew 22, the parallel, what's been happening there is that the, the Jews, different factions are coming at Jesus, trying to refute him. So you have the Herodians who come and try to refute him, and then he refutes them. And so then the Sadducees come against Jesus, and then Jesus refutes them. And then, you know, you eventually have the Pharisees and the, and the scribes. And so it's basically each person taking their turn. It's sort of like, um, you know, if you've watched uh, <laughs> one of these uh, uh, karate flicks. Uh, I used to love these growing up, but now I look, I look back at them and think, you know, you've ever seen uh, Bruce Lee in the middle of a bunch of people that are, that are trying to fight him? And I'm always thinking, why aren't they all just rushing him at once? Instead, one person at a time goes in. You know, well, that's what these guys are doing with Jesus. They're coming at him one, one at a time. And, and what's interesting is, so it says that uh, Jesus answered them and, and the people were amazed, or Jesus answered them and they didn't dare ask him another question. And so the idea is that after all these groups have exhausted their efforts to refute Jesus, Jesus replies back to them. Then Jesus asks them a question. So that's, that's the whole idea here. They've exhausted their efforts. He's answered them. Now it's his turn to ask a question. And he says, the Messiah, whose son is he? And they say, well, he's the son of David. And then Jesus puts them on the horns of a dilemma. Uh, how then uh, can, uh, how can he be David's son if David called him Lord? The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. In fact, Jesus even says, David speaking by the spirit said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. So there you have all three persons of the Godhead uh, involved in this, right? It's the spirit by David who's revealing this. Uh, so then the Jews are, are perplexed, you know, we, we, we don't know how to resolve this. Uh, so, I mean, it's just that sort of thing where I'm looking at all this and I'm thinking, you know, the, the, the early Christians didn't stumble over this, really. Maybe later there are people that start raising issues about this outside of this context, especially as, as the gospel goes forth among the Gentiles and, and such, but... Uh, you know, where you get paganism and polytheism and philosophy and all this other stuff, then it starts becoming uh, an, an issue for people, but not at this stage. And, and uh, the, the other thing is this, the other thing that, was, that, that, that struck me was, as I'm surrounded by these groups, I noticed that a lot of them were trying to ride roughshod over the New Testament witness. And they do that in this way. They'll say the Old Testament teaches that, that God is one. And so we have to approach the New Testament in light of that. Uh, if, if it appears to say something else, we, we have to say that this is a, a misunderstanding. And you know that's why if you ever engage anti-Trinitarians, you're gonna hear this. You're gonna hear Deuteronomy 6.4. You're gonna hear God is one. There's one God. There's no God before him, no God apart from him, no God besides him, no God before him or after him. All these statements, which are of a certainty there in the Old Testament text. But uh, you'll, you'll, you'll either get, and this primarily from uh, Jews or somebody who's at least using this Jewish argument, uh, you, you'll get this idea, and it's, it's true, uh, that if, if the New Testament is not in accord with the Old Testament, then we've got a colossal problem. Because the Old Testament says, in Deuteronomy 18, for example, if a prophet comes to you 
and he speaks in the name of another god or he says something that doesn't come to pass that person has spoken it presumptuously meaning he's spoken from himself not from god and that person moreover is to be put to death and then you have this additional statement in deuteronomy 13 where it says if anybody comes to you and performs a great sign or wonder or says something that that even if it comes to pass right so if they perform a wonder and it comes or, or proclaim a future event and it comes to pass you're still not to listen to that person if they proclaim another god or other gods that you have not known and so jews press this with great force especially on other jews you know they'll say jesus yeah he performed miracles they might even grant that i mean most will probably say he didn't but uh you know in the talmud it, it admits that jesus performed wonders and and they try and explain this on the grounds that Jesus was a sorcerer or in league with the devil and that sort of thing. But you could see why they might say that, because Deuteronomy 13 says a purveyor of other gods is not to be listened to, even if he performs great signs and wonders. Even, you might say, if he rises from the dead. How wise, you know, Christ's statement, uh, you know, when he said to the, the rich man when he died, you can't go back and warn your, your people because if uh if they don't listen to moses and the prophets they're not even going to believe if somebody rises from the dead a person i'm not telling you that's not important even to argue for and to, and to demonstrate to people i'm just saying that even that is something that people can suppress in light of this background belief system unless you can dislodge that from their thinking unless you can show them no you can't just assume the old testament teaches unitarianism or is against the trinity in order to discount these things regarding jesus because in fact the old testament does teach this but uh, so i encountered that that there's jewish people who will say we don't accept the new testament because it's it's a, a new god so there, there are jewish people that will say that and then there are cultists who instead of saying we should reject the new testament because it teaches a, a different god they'll say no, we don't reject the New Testament, but it's precisely because we don't accept that the New Testament teaches a different concept of God. So that's how they approach it. And then they try and force anything in the New Testament into this assumption of Old Testament Unitarianism. Okay? That's how they try and iron this out. Well, some Christians have come along and uh, I don't agree with them, but there is something to be said for this. Even if the New Testament tells us something about God that we don't know about from the Old Testament, that doesn't prove that what we're dealing with here is a different God. Some Christians here would appeal to the concept of progressive revelation. And progressive revelation is a solid principle in itself. It's certainly true. I mean, you, you get additional revelation. Uh, you know, that's, the New Testament is additional revelation. You're, you're not just being told the same thing, right? It, it's, it's drawing out implications and so forth. But we always have to be careful not to assume what the New Testament is saying that we couldn't already know from the old. Right? We don't just get to determine this is not found in the old, this is found in the new because of progressive revelation. We have to let the Bible tell us that. Right? I think, think, for example, of many people might have a difficult time proving the existence of the soul after death from the Old Testament. Some people may not know how to demonstrate from the Old Testament that people exist after death, that there is a place of punishment and bliss after death, uh, and, and would have a difficult... Uh, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses do this quite effectively when they're talking to people. They often notice where they often go when they argue against hell, when they argue against the soul. They go to the Old Testament, don't they? They especially appeal to books like Ecclesiastes, where it talks about, you know, uh, who knows if there, there's any difference between man and animal as far as death. The, uh, the author of Ecclesiastes says, you know, go to the dust, right? Is that, that's what happens. And, you know, of course, they're twisting those sorts of passages. The author is talking about his attempt to figure things out independently of divine revelation and, and just speaks of the vanity of everything from that perspective, how it all ends in futility uh, and, and so forth. But it, it is a difficulty. And that's why the Sadducees had some ability to argue with the Pharisees, right? Think of the resurrection. Where do you find the resurrection in the Old Testament? I'm not saying it's not there. I'm just saying, where do you find it? Now, your most natural inclination might be to go to the book of Daniel, where it is explicitly mentioned in chapter 12, and there's some other places. But Daniel wasn't accepted by the Sadducees, even if we accept it now, and that's relevant to us. But 
They didn't accept it. They only accepted the Torah. That's why Jesus appealed to the Torah, the five books of Moses, when he said, and notice this, this is brilliant. This shows you something of, of uh, interpretive method and so forth and the legitimacy of certain procedures. Jesus cites what God said to Moses at the burning bush. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then he says, therefore, he's not a God of the dead, but of the living. In other words, the present tense, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which presupposes that they are alive to God, not I was their God, uh, and so forth. So Jesus refutes them. But notice that's a logical inference, right? It's a deduction from what God has said. And this, this is important because people who argue against the Trinity will often say, where's an explicit statement about the Trinity? Well, we establish doctrine not only on the basis of explicit statements, but also on a good and necessary consequence. That is what follows from scripturally true premises. Right? We accept logical deduction as a legitimate way of determining truth. So anyways, uh, so some Christians have sought to resolve this by saying, well, progressive revelation. God tells us more about himself in the New Testament. Now you can imagine this sort of thing is, is a hard sell when it comes to these other groups. It might, it might be sufficient for some of us to say, okay, the New Testament just gives us some additional information. But talk to a Jewish person and, and say, yeah, the Old Testament says God is one, God is one, God is one, there's one God, there's no others, there's no others, there's no others. And then say, oh, but the New Testament, you know, says Jesus is God and the Spirit is God. That's just additional information. And see how well he takes that. He's going to think, no, nah, I'm not buying that, right? Uh, God has hammered this other notion in, into our heads. This looks like a departure from that. So there, there is problem with, at least practically, with appealing to this idea, even if it's not theoretically a problem. I mean, it's kind of like, if, if you think about it, it's kind of like the problem of evil. You've heard uh, people say, you know, really, there's not a, a logical problem of evil. Uh, we, we can resolve that sort of thing. But there is a psychological problem, uh, and that's what a lot of non-Christians fall back on. There's this psychological problem. Uh, well, not exactly the same. I'm just saying there, there's something like this here. Even if you can prove that there's not this logical problem between the new telling us something about the Trinity and the old only telling us that there's one God, it's still, uh, there's this thing, you know, for Jews and for Unitarians this just looks like something entirely new. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not buying it. But go back to the points that I was making already, that the New Testament doesn't seem to take it that way, and, and even Jews in the first century don't seem to be having a problem, problem with this. In fact, you see this, and I'm not going to go into this because it would take a lot of time, but you look at Second Temple literature and you see copious evidence that Jews believed in more than one divine person. It's, it's not distinctive to the New Testament. This is found throughout Jewish literature. It's found in the Targums. It's found in intertestamental rabbinic literature. Uh, one of my favorite statements in uh, the Book of Wisdom, it mentions, it says, uh, when the night of Passover was far spent, uh, so it's talking, you know, it's talking about Passover night. It's, it's referring back to when the, 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 the death angel comes in and, and slays the firstborn of everyone in Egypt who was in a house that didn't have the blood on the doorpost. And, uh, but it says, when the night of Passover was half spent, uh, or, fat, or far spent, something along those lines, it says, your all-powerful word from heaven's royal throne bounded like a fierce warrior into the doomed land, and he bore the sharp sword of your inexorable decree. And then it says, his head still reached to heaven while he stood upon the earth. So here you have this picture of this fantastic being. More than that, he's called God's word. He is an occupant of the divine throne. And he's, in, in fact, he's called your all powerful word. And he's the one who comes into Egypt and executes God's judgment. This is in pre-Christian Jewish literature. It's not an invention of John or Justin Martyr, a later Christian or anybody else. So that's just a taste. You've got this sort of thing all over the place. So the, the, the question that should be raised is, well, if, if you've got the New Testament authors that are so comfortable just talking about these things and easily pointing to Old Testament texts and saying, that's Jesus, that's Jesus. In fact, I didn't even quote the half of them, right? I, I just skimmed the surface. 
You know, Paul could quickly and easily say to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10 of the Israelites in the wilderness. He, he says that uh, they all ate spiritual food and drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 10, 4. Later in verse 9, Paul says that when the people of Israel rebelled, they, they tested Christ and he sent fiery serpents among them, right? It, it, he's talking about Christ, saying Christ was the one who did that. One of my favorites, because Unitarians are often blindsided by it, they don't even notice it, but Hebrews 11, the great hall of faith, where it's talking about Old Testament saints, speaks about Moses and how Moses chose to identify with the people of God and suffer with them rather than bask in the privileges that were his as the adopted son of Pharaoh or you know Pharaoh's uh, daughter. It says that uh, uh, he chose to suffer the reproach of Christ and, and to endure suffering rather than you know all the treasures of Egypt and so forth. There it's saying Moses chose to be identified with Christ and his people. How? How did he do that? How could he choose to suffer along with Christ and his people? And it's interesting, you've got some of the same language that, that will be used in the New Testament. Remember in Exodus 3, God comes down to Moses and he says, the angel of the Lord, in fact, who's called God, comes down and says, I've heard the, I've seen the affliction of my people in Egypt. Later in Isaiah 63, it says of the angel of the Lord, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. So you notice that the angel of the Lord, a divine person, according to the Old Testament, he identifies himself with his people. He says their affliction is his affliction. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, Isaiah says about the angel of the Lord. Well, remember how often Jesus speaks that way in the New Testament. In Acts 9, he, he says to Paul, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Right? Why are you persecuting me? The persecution of Christians is the persecution of Christ. He's identifying with his people. Uh, but you have this language of affliction in the New Testament too, associated with Christ, it, you know, same language. That, that's the idea going on in Hebrews 11. You also have Jude 1, 5, where Jude says, remember, it was Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt. And then it's later, it says later he, he destroyed those who didn't believe. Jesus delivered the people out of Egypt, later destroyed those who didn't believe. Jude is saying that was Jesus. So, uh, you know, what do you do with all this? Do you, if you're a Christian, you you can't just say this isn't, true to the Old Testament, you've got to do something with that. But what's even more thrilling, though, is just going to the Old Testament itself and realizing that this is all there. I mean, it, it's, it's there all over the place. And so let me give you some of that. I've spent all this time giving you the buildup. One of the first things, and I'm just going to mention this as sort of to pique your interest and, and explore this part more on your own, because there's really a variety of ways that the Old Testament points to Christ. Uh, and here I'm skipping over, by the way, Messianic prophecy. Messianic prophecy speaks of the coming Messiah, and it calls him God repeatedly, right? Isaiah 9, 6, he's called El Gibor, the mighty God. Jeremiah 23, it says, uh, it calls him the branch, the coming branch, and calls him Jehovah, our righteousness. Malachi 3, 1 calls him Ha Adon, the Lord, and says he's going to come to his temple. Zechariah 12, 10, God says, they'll look upon me whom they've pierced, and they'll mourn for him as for an only son, only son, right? It's the, uh, when that's translated into Greek, by the way, the Greek term is agapetos, and sometimes the same word is translated monogenes. Agapetos means beloved, beloved son. Monogenes means only begotten. Those are the terms used by the gospel authors to talk about Jesus. So uh, you just got all this stuff talking about the future Messiah. But what I'm thinking of here is not just statements about him to come, but what I call the real presence of Christ. Now, maybe you don't know the, why, why that's an interesting title, uh, but the, the, the debates between Protestants and Catholics over the Lord's Supper in, revolved around this question of the real presence. Uh, but I'm, I'm using this phrase differently. I'm saying that Christ is not just there in the Old Testament in the sense that he's anticipated. He's there active. He's on the scene. He's engaging with people. But here's the thing I said I was going to mention for your further exploration and then get into some other things in a little more detail. First is this whole notion of God's word. In, in Genesis 3, you have this interesting expression after Adam and Eve sin, where it says, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Okay, It doesn't say 
they heard God speaking while he was walking. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. It's the voice that's walking. That's who they hear. The Kol Yahweh Elohim. And later you have additional statements like Genesis 15 where it says the word of the Lord appeared to Abram. And then later in the text it says he took him outside. Notice it, it, it's not. And then it says, by the way, it says the word of the Lord appeared to Abraham or Abram and said to him. Okay, notice, it's not the word that's said to Abraham. It's not the word that Abraham hears I mean, in, in the sense of there's this figure and what he hears is this figure's words. It's the word who appears. It's the word who speaks. It's the word who takes Abram outside. Right? You get that sort of thing throughout the Old Testament. And this becomes the basis for Jews to interpret Old Testament theophanies as appearances of God's word, because now some would explain the rationale, I mean, why they would want to do this for, for different reasons without getting into all that. Uh, the fact is that, that Jews come to use this expression to talk often about God appearing to people and interacting with people. And you've got these incredible, fantastic statements in the Targums where it says, the word of the Lord hears our prayers whenever we pray to him. There, there's even statements like in, in, in Deuteronomy 32, one of my favorites, God says, see now that I, I am, the literal Hebrew there, it's any who, see now that I, I am, there's no God besides me, I put to death, I make alive, I've wounded, I, it's I who heal, there's no one who can deliver out of my hands. Okay. Well, well first of all, think about this. So God calls himself I am there. I am in Greek, when that's rendered into Greek, it's ego in me, right? God says in that text, there's no one who can deliver out of my hands. Does that phrase sound at all familiar to you? It should, right? It's, it's, if you look at the Greek of Deuteronomy 32, 39, and the Greek of Christ's statement in John 10, no Jew would have missed the parallel. Jesus says that I, I give my sheep eternal life, right? He says they're in my hand. Nobody can deliver them or snatch them out of my hand. And then he goes on to say the same thing about the father. And then the Jews object and they want to kill him for claiming to be God, right? But you have this Old Testament text, Deuteronomy 32, 39. And the Jews, when they paraphrase this in the Targum, they attribute this statement to the word, to the memra. It's, and then here's how they put it. This is all the more fascinating. It says, when the word of the Lord shall appear in the future to redeem his people, he shall say to them, I am he who is and who was and who shall be. Now, now start, now ask yourself this question. Where, do, where have you heard that statement before? You've heard that statement, he who is and who was and who is to come. It's used by John in the book of Revelation as a way of referring to God. You don't see that statement in the Old Testament. It's a Jewish paraphrase found in the Targums as a way of explaining the, the, the name I am or the, the expression I am, right? So John is clearly familiar with the Targums. The I am statement is viewed as an expression of God's eternal uh, self-existence, independence, and so forth. And, uh, and John is the author in the New Testament who calls Jesus what, right? It's, it's him who, it's, it's John who uses this as, as a special title for Jesus. Not that the other apostles didn't believe this, it's just they all had a distinctive ways of bringing out the, the identity of Christ. And, and so here's John, clearly familiar with the Targums, uh, quoting that. Well, so th this is among those things that you find in Jewish writings. And this comes from this Old Testament phenomena of repeatedly saying the word of the Lord appeared, the word of the Lord spoke. Um, you know, it, it says things throughout the prophets, uh, many of the, especially the, uh, uh, the minor prophets, the books will often start by saying the word of the Lord came to Hosea, the word of the Lord came to, came to, came to, this is how their, uh, prophetic, uh, career begins. The word of the Lord comes to them. And it's very easy for us to just sort of read into that. Oh, they, they're now hearing words from God. God came to them and he spoke and they heard his words. But the expression is not that. The expression is the word of the Lord came to them and said, right? Especially in Genesis 15, you also get it in the case of Samuel, you get it in other places. Uh, so there's that phenomena in the Old Testament. Then you have this other phenomena, which is much more ubiquitous, which is the angel of the Lord. 
the angel of the Lord is frequently mentioned. In fact, so frequently that you have to ask yourself the question, if the angel of the Lord is not a divine person, well, not so much a question, it's more of a problem. It's as if God has been upstaged. He's been upstaged by a created angel. And, and it's similar to a challenge I would make to Unitarians. You know, Jesus in the New Testament occupies center stage. Jesus in the New Testament is worshipped. You know, he's, there's songs sung to him in the early church, even in the New Testament. We see these things. And throughout Christian history, I mean, Christians pray to him. Prayers are found given to Christ in the New Testament. We're told that Jesus receives the worship that's given to the Father in Revelation 5.13. All creatures in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and on the sea, they worship the Lamb, it says. So universal worship is given to him. And it, so if Christ is not God, you've got this issue that it, it's like he has usurped or, or taken God's place. He's upstaged God, uh, you know, in Christian practice, unless he is God, unless he's one with the Father, unless worshiping him does not detract from the glory of the Father, right? Well, but in the Old Testament, the central figure repeatedly, and we, we read over this a lot. I, I've known Christians who are surprised when I show this to them and they think, I've, I've read that all, a lot and I've not seen this, right? But think of the first recorded appearance of the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord appears to Hagar in Genesis 16. Hagar has fled from Sarai, her mistress, because they're, they're having issues, right? She had relations with Abram. She has a son. Now she's exalting herself over Sarai. Sarai is miffed about this. Uh, you know, who knew that was going to go bad? <laughs> um, you know, sleep with my husband and... Uh, uh, we'll, we'll all be happy with this situation. No, that, that didn't work out. Anyways, um, Genesis 16, it says, the angel of the Lord appeared to Hagar. In fact, let me pull up the text. So Genesis 16, I, li I like the NAS, um, but uh, it says, now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness by the spring on the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that there'll be too many to count. Now, I'm going to read more of this, but what I was trying to encourage you on here is to read carefully because we read superficially far too often. Here's the question I want to ask you first off. How does the angel of the Lord identify himself to Hagar? Okay, it's very easy for us just to think, okay, so Hagar's, Hagar's think, you know, knows she's encountered the angel of the Lord. But the text nowhere says that, right? The, he nowhere tells Hagar his name, right? He doesn't say that, okay? He just arrives on the scene out of the blue. There's no self-identification, okay? There, there's nothing stated here about, you know, no name, nothing. Just here I am. And then, you know, so the only thing that Hagar has to go on is the stuff that he's, he's saying to her and the assumptions that, that underlie that, right? He, he, he uh, calls her Hagar. He calls her by name, okay? That's interesting. How does this guy out in the middle of nowhere know my name? Then he, uh, he presumes to tell her what to do to go back and submit to Sarah. So he assumes some authority over her. He tells her she has a child in her womb and also arrogates to himself the right to tell her what his name is going to be. So he also knows it's going to be a son. Right? He hasn't performed any ultrasound, <laughs> right? Uh, so this person is some unordinary person. That's what would stand out from all of this. But the, the capstone of it all is that he says to her, uh, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that there'll be too many to count. That's the same promise that God makes to Abraham right? God makes to Abraham. Here's the angel of the Lord. And remember, she doesn't know it's the angel of the Lord. He has not called himself anything. All she knows is this figure knows me by name, knows I have a child in my womb, knows it's a son, and has even told me the future course of his life. He's going to be a, you know, a wild person. He goes on in verse 11 to say, uh, uh, behold, you're with child, you'll bear a son, you should call his name uh, Ishmael. Uh, but now notice this, because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. Well, now we've got this curiosity. This figure has assumed all sorts of authority, knows things that strike one as odd, that, you know, how does he know these things? And then makes a divine promise. I'm going to greatly multiply your descendants. 
But now he talks about God in the third person. So is he God or somebody else? He says what God can say, God alone can say, but then he talks about God. So, you know, is he somebody who comes from God, somebody who is with God, or is he God? Uh, and you might not have caught my little allusion there to John 1.1, 1, 1, where John says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, right? John has no problem thinking these two things go together. Well, here we have in Genesis 16, this figure who is somehow uh, assumes divine prerogatives, makes divine promises, and yet talks about the Lord. Now, here's the, the million dollar question. He didn't tell her who he is, but how does she identify him? Look at verse 13. Verse 13 says, then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are a God who sees me. Okay, so she calls him God. Now, I've had Jewish people say, oh, that's just because Hagar was sort of overwhelmed by this and, and rashly called him God, you know, but she was wrong, right? But notice there's a critical flaw here. It's not just Hagar who identifies him as a divine person, but Moses. Okay, remember I said to read carefully. You're thinking, where's Moses in this account? Moses is the author of the account, right? Notice before he quotes her, he says, then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. Then he quotes Hagar, you are a God who sees me. So Moses calls him Lord. That's the Hebrew name for God, Jehovah. So Moses said, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You're a God who, the God who sees me. Now, maybe you're, you're sort of puzzled because he's called the angel of the Lord here, even if he doesn't tell Hagar that's who he is. And you're thinking an angel's a creature, right? Well, not in Hebrew, not necessarily. Well, the, the term angel doesn't communicate anything about the kind of being. I mean, it, it at least you could say it communicates. Well, no, it doesn't even communicate that. Well, what I was going to say is you might say it at least communicates or assumes whenever it's used that it's talking about a rational being. But even that's not necessarily true. The term malach is sometimes used for the wind. The winds are called God's messengers. Plagues and things like that are called God's messengers, right? So it's not necessarily a reference to heavenly hosts. It can be, but it's also used for men, right? In, in Genesis 32, we're told uh, you have this actually fascinating thing in Hebrew. Our English translations obscure it. But in Hebrew, it talks about Jacob sending, or first of all, it says, you know, he sends his family ahead of him he's about to meet esau after many years esau was angry with him the last time he saw him right he's going back he doesn't know how he's going to be received and then we're told uh that uh angels there were angels that 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 attended upon him and therefore he named it mahanaim which means two camps because he says this is the camp of god if there are angels here then god must be present right uh, and it's also on that occasion, remember, he wrestles with uh, uh, a man and and uh, he calls the place Peniel because he saw God face to face. Peniel means th the face of God. Well, um, but but what's interesting is, so it says that uh, these angels appear. So therefore, he calls it Mahanaim, two camps. But the the. It, then it says that he sent messengers ahead of him to Esau. He sent a company of people ahead to sort of pacify Esau or find out if he's angry, right? Send him with gifts and stuff like that. That way, if, if Esau attacks them, then he has advanced notice to flee, right? Well, the word for angels in Deuteronomy, or excuse me, Genesis 32, 1 and 2, and the word for messengers is the same Hebrew word. It's used for the heavenly host there and for those Jacob sends ahead of him. So notice the term doesn't have any ontological con you know, significance. It's just a way of referring to messenger, somebody sent, somebody who goes from another. Um, you know, it just it doesn't tell you what kind of being is in view. You have to determine that contextually. So when you look at this specific phrase, though, the angel of the Lord, that's a distinctive phrase where the term angel is part of a Hebrew construction. Uh, where in every case when you see this figure throughout the Torah, 
uh, the early prophets, uh, you know, on through Israel's history, it always refers to a divine person, a person who's called God, a person who speaks as God, a person who receives divine worship, a person, you know, everything about him bespeaks deity. And he's distinguished from the Lord. Okay. So now go, if you haven't seen this before, and maybe many of you have, but now go and read all these other texts about the angel of the Lord. He appears over and over again in the Old Testament. He, he appears to Abraham in Genesis 22. He's the one who appears out of heaven and says, don't slay Isaac, right? He says, now I know that you uh, fear God because you have not withheld from me your only son. And then it says uh, he, you know, uh, he swore uh, by himself, right? Uh, surely as I live, you know, he's going to bless Abraham. And this is the background of the author of Hebrews statement when he says that God, because there's none greater by whom he can swear, swore by himself. He's talking about the figure in the Old Testament that the text calls the angel of the Lord. Okay, Genesis 22, uh, Genesis 25, uh, 26, the angel of the Lord appears. 28, the angel of the Lord appears to Jacob. Uh, 31, uh, he appears to Jacob in a dream. In fact, if you look at 31, 11, it says the angel of the Lord appeared to Jacob in a dream. And then in verse 13, he, it says, he said to him, to Jacob, the angel of the Lord said to Jacob, I am the God of Bethel, <laughs> right, that appeared to you. He's referring back to his appearance to him in Bethel. And, and you'll even find, if you read these texts closely, you'll find in some cases it only mentions God appearing to somebody. It doesn't use the phrase angel of the Lord. But then when you come to a later text that refers back to the incident, it uses the phrase angel of the Lord. So you find out that there are occasions where it was the angel of the Lord, even though that occasion doesn't call him that there. And then it's the opposite. You have occasions where an Old Testament text will call him the angel of the Lord, but then a later Old Testament text referring back to it will simply say it was God. Right. So over and over again, you get this. Who was it that appeared to Moses in Exodus 3? And I'm skipping over a bunch of texts here. Who appeared to Moses? We all just know to say God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Moses said to God, what's your name? What shall I tell the people of Israel? Who, who it is that sent me to them? God says, I am who I am. Thus shall you say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Well, who in the context does it say appeared to him? Exodus 3, 2 says the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in, in the bush, right? In, in the uh, midst of a bush that was on fire, but not consumed. I mean, it's, it's just all over the place. And uh, and then you get, uh, I mean, there's just so many texts. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, Judges 2. In fact, uh, I'm going to go there because it, it's so rich. Again, this is a, uh, not only an attempt to uh, show you this point, but uh, also as, a, as an encouragement to close reading of the text. Uh, and, you know, not just in respect to this or with respect to this, but every issue you, you read we we take things for granted you know we kind of assume it's almost like we you know we know it's the word of god but we read it as if it was you know just just some novel or something uh you know th there's a depth here that goes well beyond uh what our superficial reading would uh uh you know seem to assume but it says in in 2 1 notice this the angel of the lord came up from gilgal to bochim now here this is perhaps not that easy to notice, but it's interesting that the last time the angel of the Lord was mentioned, uh, or I would argue that he's mentioned, is in Joshua 5, where he appears to Joshua as the captain of the Lord's hosts. Right, The captain of the Lord's hosts appears there with drawn sword. There are numerous intertextual links back to the appearance to Moses, right? Uh, uh, the, the captain of the Lord's hosts appears to Joshua. Joshua is told to take off his shoes. He's standing on holy ground. So is Moses. Right? There, there are a bunch of parallels if you go read those texts. There, there's in, th this is an, an Old Testament way of tying things together. So you have these echoes of earlier texts, and, and they're, they're intended to evoke those old, uh, earlier contexts. It's not like the authors could say, go to Exodus 3.2. There, there was no chapter and verse divisions. So they used verbal and thematic clues to do that. Um, well, uh, uh, so the last recorded appearance, I would argue, of the angel of the Lord is in Joshua 5. 
where Joshua was in Gilgal. Now, this is a long time later, but at least narratively, you already have this notion sort of evoked, right? If you're sensitive to these sorts of things. Narratively, Gilgal comes up again, and here we have the angel of the Lord, who was last seen in Gilgal. But here's what he says. The angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, listen to these words, I brought you up from the land of Egypt, and I uh, led you into the land which I have sworn to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And as for you, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed me. What is this you have done? Therefore, I also said, I'll not drive them out before you. And it goes on. Uh, and then at verse four says, when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to the sons of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. So they named the place, uh, that place Bochim, uh, which means weepers. And there they sacrificed to the Lord. Okay, but, but notice this. That phrase, I, I brought you up from the land of Egypt, that's a constant Old Testament refrain. That's what God says to the people repeatedly. This is why they're obligated to him. It's the preface to the Ten Commandments. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage. Therefore, have no other gods before me. It's the basis of their obedience, right? Not only because God is their maker, but he's their redeemer. He delivered them from Egypt. Therefore, they're obligated to obey him. Um, but, but notice this. He says... Okay, I want you to see how he's identifying himself with all previous generations of Israel. He's identifying himself as the God of their fathers, even the God of the patriarchs. Notice, again, it's, it's profound. He says, I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. He's saying this during the period of the judges, right? Much later, long after the wilderness wanderings. He's saying, I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. So he's identifying himself as the one who was present at and accomplished the Exodus. But then notice what he said, which I have sworn to your fathers. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I swore that to your fathers. I accomplished it, right? And here I am talking to you. He has just given you an Old Testament history lesson in a sense. I'm the God who was, uh, you know, there with your fathers in the wilderness and, and their fathers before them. The one that I, I swore, right? He swore that to Abraham, Genesis 15, Genesis 17, Genesis 22. That's where these oaths were made. That's where you have the reference to God swearing to the fathers that he would give uh, this land to their descendants. So uh, very clearly the angel of the Lord is identifying himself as a divine person. Uh, you even have the angel of the Lord being prayed to, Genesis 48, 15, and 16. Jacob prays to the angel of the Lord. In fact, Jacob does something very similar there. He says, may the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. He's blessing the sons of Joseph. The, the Hebrew verb, bless the lads, is singular in Hebrew. Which means, I mean, it's the verb that's it's forestalled. It's it's sort of a you're, you're sort of on the edge of your seat. You know, where's the verb here, right? He says, "May the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, may he what, right? May uh, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God uh, uh, who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, what? May he what? The angel who redeemed me from all evil. You're still waiting. What?" You know, and then he says, bless the lads. In Hebrew, it's may he bless the lads. He, he has just referred to the same figure as the God of his fathers, Abraham and Isaac, the God who's been his shepherd all his life, and the angel who redeemed him from all evil as the same person. Um, so, so there you have, I mean, prayer being offered to him. He's blessing his children in the name of the angel of the Lord. That's the first occurrence of the word redeemed in the Bible, and it's associated with the angel of the Lord, right? Uh, I mean, so there, there, there's just so much stuff in the Old Testament. Now, you might be asking yourself, how do we know this figure is Jesus? Well, it already goes a huge way uh, to paving the way for Christianity, right? We, 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 whatever else we might want to say or could say, we have this much. There's another divine person uh, in the Old Testament. He's there. He's all over the place. In fact, one of my favorite examples, I can't miss this, is uh, Genesis uh, 18 and 19. In Genesis 18, it speaks of three men appearing to Abraham. And, and I'll, I'll kind of try and wind up here with this. I just 
want to make sure I wrap this up, uh, tie it off a little bit. But Genesis 18, 3, it says Abraham looks up, right? Uh, he sees three men. He's in his tent. It's hot. Uh, but in, in good old, uh, you know, Middle Eastern fashion, he rushes to, to uh, tend to them, right? The Middle Eastern people uh, are uh, known for their hospitality. This is a very important aspect of Middle Eastern culture. And this is what Abraham does. He's these three men rushes to tend to their needs. Um, it's not apparent to Eric, uh, excuse me, Abram, Abraham, who, who these three are at first, uh, but it quickly becomes apparent that one of these men is no ordinary figure. He promises, uh, in fact, uh, I'm going to mention this. I, I didn't, I didn't plan on it, but I just, I, in the spirit of encouraging you all to read closely, I'm going to ask this question just, just to st- just to stimulate your thoughts. I'm going to read it, though. I want to make sure I read it exactly right. Um, in Genesis 18, uh, it says that, uh, verse 9, they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, they're in the tent. He said, I will surely return to you at this time next year. And behold, Sarah, your wife will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door, which is, uh, was behind him. Now, Abram and Sarah were old, advanced in age, and then we're told that uh, Sarah laughed. Okay. Now, God makes a promise here to Abraham and Sarah. In light of God's promise, what do you think Abraham was looking forward to next year? Okay, now, now, I'm not going to make you answer because I'm not. The point here isn't to embarrass anyone, um, and not that you should be embarrassed. I mean, this is, you know, all intended to, uh, you know, get us thinking and so forth. And we miss things. That this isn't something I noticed the first ten times I read the Bible, but you know, eventually, eventually it stood out to me. But um, most people would say, and they're not wrong in this, but most people would say what Abraham was looking forward next to next year was the birth of his son. Right. But now hear the text again. Listen to it closely. I will surely return to you at this time next year. And behold, Sarah, your wife will have a son. What do you think Abraham was looking forward to next year? Now, you're not wrong to say he was looking forward to the birth of his son. But if God just told you that he's going to return to you at this time next year, don't you think (laughs) that your expectation, the greater part of it, if you will, surpassing anything else is the return of God. God God's standing before him in physical form. And he says, I'm going to return to you at the appointed time next year. Now, what does Sarah do here? We're, we're told that she laughs, right? This sounds incredible to her. Um, and then the Lord rebukes her, <laughs> right? It, you know, she's probably, I mean, you know, who knows how much she understood what was going on at this point, but she laughs. Uh, and, uh, later we learn when Isaac is born that the laughter, their laughter turns to one, not of incredulity, but of joy. In fact, they name Isaac laughter to, to express the joy, uh, that, uh, they have at the birth of Isaac. So you might say they rejoiced at, at that time, but they're looking forward to that time when God would return and his return would coincide with the birth of a son. Well, isn't it interesting? The reason I I am saying some of this is because uh, as I'm talking, I mean, there's so I wanted to go in one direction. I am going to go there, but so many things just pop out. You know, there's so many threads here. I I can't miss this one. In John chapter eight, Jesus is arguing with the religious leaders. Right. There's this long debate that they're engaged in. And one of the things that comes up over and over again is their true paternity and Christ's identity, right? In other words, who their father is. Jesus is insinuating that their father isn't who they think he is, right? Jesus is, uh, you know, calling into question their true uh, generation, right? Where they come from. They're also laying, you know, some things at Christ's doorstep. You know, they say, aren't we, you know, they say we weren't born of fornication. They're, they're suggesting that Jesus is a product of fornication. You know, your mother suddenly became pregnant. You're, you know, uh, yeah, she had a, you know, and if that's their insinuation is something along those lines. 
But Abraham comes up over and over again. And Jesus uh, is constantly, on the one hand, he's denying that Abraham is their father. On the other hand, he's not denying that Abraham is their father. And what you've got going on is this sense of, there's this physical sense in which Abraham is their progenitor, but there's also this spiritual sense in which he isn't. Well, at one point in John 8, Jesus says something that would have had them scratching their heads and it, it intensifies as the con conversation goes on. But uh, I'm starting in verse 31, John 8. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Now notice, these people clearly don't know who they are. They're saying we're descendants of Abraham. We've never been in slavery to anyone. What were they told to remember? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, right? That's who they are as a people, the people whom God delivered from slavery. These Jews are saying we've never been in slavery to anyone. They, they've just told on themselves. They're saying he's not our father, right? That, that's not what they're intending, but they're, they, they've clearly forgotten something, haven't they? Then it goes on, Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are descendants of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Now, I, I just want you to notice that there, there seems to, Jesus seems to be insinuating that there's an incongruity here. I know you're Abraham's descendants, yet you're seeking to kill me. He's, he's suggesting that these two things don't go together. Okay, if, if you're Abraham's descendants, what gives? Why are you seeking to kill me? Okay, that's the first thing that I want you to think about. Verse 38, he says, I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. Now he's telling them that the reason they're acting the way they are is because they're just imitating their father. Do you think he's still talking about Abraham? No, he's not. He's talking about somebody else. And later in the context, it becomes clear. He's talking about Satan. Your father's the devil, Jesus will eventually tell them. But there's this contrast between Abraham being their father in some sense, and yet not in another sense, and their true father in that sense being this other character, Satan, right? Keep listening. Verse 39, they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. So they pick up on the insinuation. They pick up on the idea that Jesus is questioning their tie to Abraham. Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you're seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Okay, this Abraham did not do. You're doing the deeds of your father. They said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God, and it goes on. But did you catch it? Here, here's the, the critical part. If you're Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you're seeking to kill me. Okay. So the great proof that they're not children of Abraham is that they're seeking to kill him. And then notice what Jesus goes on to say. You're doing the deeds of uh, of your father, right? But verse, verse uh, 40 says, as it is, you're seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God, this Abraham did not do. What didn't Abraham do? He's saying, you're trying to do something that proves you're not really children of Abraham. Abraham didn't do that. What is it they're trying to do? They're trying to kill Jesus. And Jesus says, this Abraham did not do. Okay. In other words, these Jews are not quick to receive Jesus. They're certainly not doing so in all hospitality, right? Uh, by contrast to Abraham, whom we know from at least Genesis 18, when God appeared to him in human form as a man and told him the truth, right? Abraham served the Lord. Uh, and then uh, he believed God's promise and looked forward to the birth of his son, Isaac. How does this account in John 8 end? Later in John 8, the Jews finally get it. They're a little dull. Uh, and, and then they realize Jesus is claiming to know Abraham. They say, you're not yet 50 years old and, and you know Abraham. 
And, and what does Jesus say to them? Um, well, actually, uh, go back. Uh, they say, uh, or Jesus says to them in verse 66, or 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Notice, Jesus is not talking about Abraham prophetically, you know, seeing what was happening right then. Jesus standing there with the Jews or the cross. Or He's talking about some past occasion. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He looked forward with joy to my day. He saw it and was glad. That day came and went. Abraham saw it. The day happened. And Abraham rejoiced. And then Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham became, I am. That's the, the literal Greek, before he became, I am. Um, so uh, Jesus, I, I submit to you, is identifying himself as the one who appeared to Abraham. There's, there's more that could be said here. Here's why it gets interesting, or here's where it gets all the more interesting. It's God who appears to Abraham in Genesis 18. The text is clear. Later in the text, he tells Abraham that he's going down into Sodom to see if it's uh, guilty of the outcry that has ascended to heaven. And uh, two angels go on ahead of him, but then eventually the Lord departs from Abraham too. But remember, God told Abraham he's going down into Sodom. He's going to uh, be there on the scene. Uh, and, and so when you get to Genesis 19... And you read this, you should be asking yourself, what's going on here? You're not really going to ask that because you already know what's going on here by now if you didn't already. Um, verse 24 says this, Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. You see that? The Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Notice the preposition. There's a subject-object distinction here, and it's all the more apparent in Hebrew. There's a subject, the Lord. The Lord reigned on Sodom and Gomorrah, and then there's another called Lord. He rained fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of heaven. Now, if I were to ask you, if, if, uh, if you were reading the Jewish Targums, which are these ancient paraphrases of the Jews, not Christian products, they're, they're not made by Christians, who, the, the, the Jews needed a way to speak of these figures that are both called by the divine name and somehow distinguish them uh, you know, using some other cognomen, alternative term. What term do you think they used in the Targums? The term is memra or word, right? The word of the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. So, I mean, I haven't even, you know, come close to looking at everything, but I hope you can see from this. Oh, oh what I wanted to do before I, before I forget uh, is make a connection to Jesus. Uh, you may recall on two occasions, people asked the angel of the Lord his name. Uh, in Genesis, Jacob asked the man that's wrestling with him, what is your name? And the angel of the Lord says, why do you ask my name? Right. Uh, later in Judges 13, uh, Manoah, the father of Samson, asked the angel of the Lord his name. But there he adds a statement to it. He, he, uh, the angel of the Lord in his reply says, why do you ask my name? It is wonderful. And that word you know, can mean, and in some translations is rendered beyond comprehension. But the word is used uh, exclusively for God in the Old Testament. It, it's only used for God. God alone is wonderful. God alone performs wonders. It's just, it's an exclusive, you know, we use the word wonderful in English way too loosely by Old Testament standards. You know, you might say this was a wonderful cheeseburger. No Hebrew would speak like that. God alone is wonderful, right? And so here's the angel of the Lord. Why do you ask my name? It is wonderful. Now think about Isaiah 9, 6. When it talks, there's a prophecy about Jesus, right? Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, 
Uh, the government shall be at rest upon his shoulders. And this is the name by which he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace. Uh, I know it normally says Everlasting Father, but the he Hebrew syntax means Father of Eternity, meaning he possesses that quality. Uh, it's not calling him God the Father. Um, but there he's called Wonderful. Now, Interestingly, the Jews, this isn't lost on the Jews. If you look at the Septuagint, you know what it says here? It, it recognizing that this is a, you know, the, the, the son that's going to be given is called the mighty God. So it's a divine person, but he's also called wonderful. They recognize that as a divine title, a title used for the angel of the Lord. The Septuagint translates that and says, this is the name by which he shall be called the angel of great counsel right? The angel of great counsel, wonderful counselor. You can see how they would arrive at that. So this is part of the case for not only identifying the Christ in uh, the Old Testament, teaching a uh, plurality of persons. And I've only focused on one other person, the son. It also mentions the spirit, right? Over and over again in the Old Testament, the spirit is mentioned and his personhood, by the way, that's a topic for another time. But, uh, you also have the, the, the connection between that figure and the Lord Jesus. One other thing I'll say about this uh, for you to think about is the Old Testament, it says, is a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. Non-Christians, Jews, Muslims, anti-Trinitarians, not only object to the whole idea of a second divine person in the Godhead, they also object to the idea that God could become incarnate. Notice how wonderfully the Old Testament anticipates these objections and serves as a pedagogue, like Paul says, to lead us to Christ. Paul says the law is a schoolmaster, a pedagogue, to lead us to Christ. Here you have an Old Testament figure distinguished from the Lord and also identified as Lord. And what is he doing? As if he has no problem with this, at every turn he's appearing in a physical form. Not because he's become incarnate yet, that's not until the, the, you know, the womb of Mary, but he is showing by these palpable demonstrations that this is not something beneath him. It's not beyond his power to do. And it's not beneath his dignity, his majesty. Muslims like to say, oh, it's beneath God to do that sort of thing. Well, tell that to Abraham who, you know, rushed to clean his feet. Um, all right. So I'll, I'll conclude with that and open it up or for whatever uh, Sean wants to do here. All right, uh, we want to open up the floor to oh, any looks questions. Kind of like he froze, um, but I think the idea was that I would take questions. So, uh, hey, Sean, if I may, yes, yeah, this is Ron in uh, up in McKinney. Um, first of all, thank you so much for doing this, and you have a great gift for communication. You're in the right business, <laughs> God's business of communicating. Thank you for being a pastor and theologian. Hey, um, I missed a little bit because I had a critical phone call with a sick friend. But, uh, did you mention Psalm 35? And I wonder if you didn't. It appears that David is calling out to God as his salvation but then calling on the angel of the Lord to drive out the enemies. Is that yeah, so, um, yeah, so in fact, um, you have Psalm 35, and hold on, I'm pulling up the other one here. Uh, right before it, if you look at Psalm 34, verse 7, it says, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Okay, who is it that encamps around his people? It's, it's God. But notice he's also the object of their fear. You know, in an Old Testament context, you're to fear no one but God. And, and curses is anyone who puts his trust in princes or who fears, you know, men and, and so forth. So 34 and 35 have this uh, teaching about the angel of the Lord. Uh, as the one who encamps around the people, who rescues them, delivers them, saves them, right? Psalm 34, 7, and they're, they're to fear him. And then, as you said, 
uh, Psalm 35 uh, speaks of the angel of the Lord. Uh, verse 5 says, Let them, the wicked, be like chaff before the wind with the angel of the Lord driving them on. Right. In fact, this brings up another issue. I sometimes hear Christians that when they're trying to talk about how powerful angels are, they'll mention how they'll, they'll say things like an angel slew 185,000 men of the Assyrian army. They, they mention the reference in Isaiah and Chronicles and so forth. But the text says the angel of the Lord did that. This is not proof of the, the, the great power of angels. It's proof of the great power of the angel of the Lord. He's the one who slew those, uh, those men of, of the Assyrian army. Um, so don't, don't use that to fill out your angelology. Uh, you should use that to fill out your theology, your Christology. Um, if I may, so, um, this is playing devil's advocate, um, primarily because I deal a lot with cults. Um, mm -hmm. so I do a lot, I've had to deal, I do a lot of, uh, helping college students, fellow college students and peers kind of get familiar with cultic theology and how to talk through it and talk around it. So I'm playing devil's advocate on something that I don't know how to answer. <laughs> um, with angel of the Lord, um, and, and I'm hoping the Hebrew is a little bit more precise and can help answer this. What would we do with the line of argumentation that it is a specific angel that is under the authority of the one who is called the Lord, the angel of the Lord, rather than the angel and the Lord being made to be the same? Well, I do think the title distinguishes him from the Lord, right? The angel of the Lord, just like son of God or something like that distinguishes mm -hmm. him from God in that sense, meaning the father, right? My point, and I've made this with those other passages, you have that in, in these other contexts where he talks about the Lord as another person, and then the text turns around and calls him Lord. So it's not either or, it's both and. He is the Lord, he's distinct from the Lord. That's critical to it being a Trinitarian datum, right? It's mm -hmm. not that. If he's not somehow distinct from the Lord, then this doesn't help for the Trinity. It's just a way of you know, talking about that singular divine person that the Old Testament talks about, uh, according to Unitarians, right? So he is distinguished from the Lord, but not as a inferior being, but as another person who's divine. And, and one thing that the cults will do along these lines is they'll bring up what's called the principle of agency. And they'll say that an agent can, can speak on behalf of the one who represents him. And there's a lot of problems with this. Uh, one is, you know, think this through for a moment. If, you know, it's one thing for me to give authority to somebody to act in my name. And let's say they go and they, you know, they're, they're saying my words to this person. What, what Unitarians are trying to say is that, that a representative can go and say things like, I am God and all this stuff. And all, because all he's doing is representing God. And so, you know, there, there can be some blurring there because of that. Uh, I don't think that holds up, but uh, th there are limits to that sort of thing, and even the cults would grant this. For example, the Old Testament says God alone is to be worshipped, God alone is to be sacrificed to. So when you see the angel of the Lord being worshipped and sacrificed to, now you know he's not just a representative. It'd be like me saying that somebody is my representative, he can represent me, act on my behalf, and then the person saying, well, since I'm his representative and, you know, got these rights and prerogatives, I can have relations with his wife. No, there are certain prerogatives that remain mine that don't belong to my representative. Worship is exclusive to God. The angel of the Lord is worshipped. He's worshipped in Judges 6, Judges 13, other places. I have a whole, a whole series of articles on this, by the way, on answeringislam.org, answeringislam.org. If you go on the left-hand column, it says individual authors, and then look for my name there. Uh, once you press individual authors, it'll bring up a bunch of names. You'll have my name there, and there's a series of articles called The Melach Yahweh, which is the angel of the Lord, whole series there, uh, which, which covers a lot of this stuff, because I realize I'm not saying everything that could be said. 
Um, but um, I also have on my YouTube channel debates that I've done with Unitarians on this topic. I did a debate with one Unitarian just on whether the Old Testament teaches that the angel of the Lord is God. And then another debate that I did with somebody on is the angel of the Lord the pre-incarnate Christ. Uh, so for, fu for, for future study. Um, thank you. My name is uh, Caius and I am uh, the chapter director for uh, Romanian. Um, I am very familiar with the Jewish, uh, my brother is a Hasidic Jew, and I know kind of quite well, you know, the argument. And one thing that, you know, they playing on the ignorance of the Christians uh, regarding the Jewish language and what he means. And I'm going to give a simple example. For, for instance, Elohim, it's a plural noun, and Elohim, it's a, it's a singular. And yet in the Bible, you find the God representing himself of Elohim 2,500 times, while, while as a singular, it's only 250 times. They know about it. And they know that it's a plurality of God when he said, you know, uh, his name is Elohim. And, but uh, they're playing the cards. And uh, I hope, you know, that uh, we're doing a better job in understanding uh, their points that it's not quite valid. Yeah, I mean... Uh... One thing, it's a very curious fact, um, that there's a perfectly good singular form of the word. You have El or Eloa for God, and yet the Hebrew text prefers, the, the, the prophets prefer the plural form, Elohim. Now, they do use it in conjunction with singular verbs, so they're not talking about more than one true God, but they are using a term which already suggests plurality. So you've got to think, why would they do that? I can assure you, having interacted with a lot of Unitarians, that if a Unitarian were writing the Bible, he wouldn't do that, right? They, they hate the fact that that word is there, right? And it's not just the word Elohim. There are other plural terms that are used for God. Isaiah 54, 5 refers to God as the husbands and makers of his people. Husbands and makers, it's plural, right? Ecclesiastes 12.1, it says, Remember now your creators in the days of your youth. It's talking about God as man's creators, right? There, there are other plural expressions. And so even if somebody wants to say, well, they don't prove Trinitarianism, you still got to ask the question, you know, why are they being used? I, and there's so much more that I can say. It's not like I'm resting my case on all of this, but I, you do have to ask, what gives it's like the prophets aren't troubled that this term might be apt to lead people to think god is not just one person <laughs> you know so there there is that and uh and besides that there are these interesting occasions when the the noun the noun elohim is used with a plural verb okay it's ordinarily the case that it's used with a singular right so so for example we're not used to this because we don't have our language doesn't have built into the verb well it's not the same let's just say uh, but in hebrew the verb contains the subject and so for example the first verse of genesis says in the beginning god created right better sheet is in the beginning bara elohim so bara is the word for create elohim is the word for god so you have uh, the verb preceding the the noun in Hebrew. But what's interesting is the, the verb bara is, means he created, literally. But then the word Elohim is plural, right? So it's literally Elohim, which is plural, he created, which is singular. So that's curious, right? And uh, But then you do have these occasions when the verb is not singular. Uh, Genesis 20, 13 uh, uses a plural verb in connection with God. Genesis 35, 7 uses a plural verb. Uh, it says um, in Genesis 35, 7, it tells uh, Jacob to go to Bethel and build an altar there uh, to God, uh, you know, where they reveal themselves to you. You know, what do you do with that? <laughs> yeah. Pastor Rogers, we have a question in the comments. It says, uh, would you admonish Christians to learn Hebrew to better understand and communicate the revelation of Jesus Christ in the New Testament? 
Well, it certainly doesn't hurt. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, a lot depends on, you know, your calling, your aptitude. You know, I, I, uh, long before I went to seminary, you know, I went to seminary very late in my Christian life. I always wanted to go, but I had a lot of obstacles. Remember, I was converted at 18 as a, a you know, criminal and had only read two books in my life. I had to go back and get a GED because I flunked out of high school before I went into prison. Um, then I had to go get a college education. Most seminaries require a college education. And then I, you know, I got, I, during that time, got a wife and kids and, and that, you know, kept me busy and working and all that. So I did a lot of reading before ever going to seminary. When I got into seminary, I had, you know, I, I don't mean this in any arrogant way. I'm just saying, I, you know, I, I had mastered the material that they were going to require of me already. The languages, though, I had not. And they, that was a, you know, I... I noticed that when I was there, that there were certain people that had this aptitude for language that well exceeds my own, right? They just picked this up like, you know, an easy thing. Me, it took a bit more work. It was, you know, uh, I, you know, theology, biblical theology, apologetics, uh, other issues are, are easy to me. Language was a bit more difficult. And I knew a, a kid in seminary who was dyslexic and it was just terrible for him. I mean, he, he had such a terrible time with the language. You know, uh, but uh, I believe really in, uh, strongly in an educated ministry. So it, it, the goal for me was pastoral ministry. And of course, I like to do apologetics, but it used to be that pastors were the best educated people in America. Okay, that's not so much the case today. You know, <laughs> people could go to their pastors and ask anything, right? They'd ask them about science, they'd ask them about astronomy, they'd ask about all sorts of things. Their pastor was the most educated man. That's just not true today. But, and I, you know, uh, I'm not saying, you know, you need to know all that. I, but I, you know, I do think that the one thing they should have done is learned the languages because it, it does enhance all sorts of things. It puts you in a good position to, to faithfully preach the text and so forth. But, you know, it, it depends on your purposes and what you're doing. I know many people that get along quite well apologetically without the languages. We have very good English translations. We have commentaries. Uh, and, you know, the languages help with certain things, but they don't solve everything. You can still debate. I could debate with a Jewish person what the Hebrew text says, even though I know Hebrew or the Greek text with the Greek speaking person, you know, even though they know Greek, we have some of the same issues. Some, some issues go away because the language rules certain things out, but you still have contextual issues. You've, you've got issues of just reasoning through the text. People aren't good at reasoning. You know, people need to take classes in logic. I think, uh, you know, there's, there's that sort of thing, but uh, you know, so a lot depends on what you're doing, what's going to be useful. I, I know that before I learned the languages as a Christian, I was doing apologetics and got along quite well in engaging non-Christians, you know, without that. You know, I would run into a Jehovah's Witness and sure, it would have been nice if I knew Greek and because I knew they didn't know Greek, right? But they would quote Greek because their books tell them what to say, right? So they'd parrot this stuff and, uh, you know, but I could I could still deal with that before I knew Greek. So, I mean, you, you just really have to weigh what you're doing and how important the languages are to that particular thing, right? I mean, some of you are maybe focused on philosophical issues pertaining to the faith and the defense of the faith or, you know, or whatever. Uh, others of you are focused on, you know, different things. So a lot just depends. It's certainly not going to hurt. Uh, and it'll bless you too. I mean, there's stuff that you'll read. I'm, I'm amazed. Uh, I, I had a friend years ago. I remember he was a godly man, but he just really, uh, shocked me one day. He said, you know, he says, I'm, I'm having trouble getting into my Bible. He says, I'm still praying all the time. You know, I, I go to the Lord in prayer, have fellowship with him and so forth, but I can't get into my Bible. You know, he goes, he says, I know it so well. Now, this was like 20 years ago, he said this to me. He's since died. You know, he's gone on to be with the Lord. But here I am 20 years later. And even at that time, I had, you know, gone through the Bible far more times than he had. 
I'm here now 20 years later, and I haven't in, in a single moment of my life thought that I know the Bible so well that I, you know, I could just set it aside. I've never felt that way ever. I always feel like there's so much more here that I'm missing, right? And, um, you know, but there, there's stuff that, you know, it's not that Hebrew's a magic language or, or Greek's a magic language, but no language perfectly translates into another language, right? And there's just things that are lost. I sometimes wonder how hymns are translated from one language to another and still retain this, this beauty to them. You know, like, a mighty fortress is our God, Martin Luther's famous hymn right how, how did they do that over into english it just you know somebody had to i don't know it, it's not like it rhymes in both languages just somebody had to work at it right well if you look at a here's just an example of, of something that you'll see in the hebrew text you won't see in english uh psalm 119 the longest chapter of the bible uh it, it has it's broken down into sections of eight verses right 22 sections of eight verses a piece if you look at your english copy right right there in your english copy before each section it has a hebrew letter right even in your english copy it'll it'll have a, a hebrew letter so the first eight verses have aleph which is the first letter in in hebrew the second set of eight verses have bet which is the second letter so it goes all the way down through the letters of the hebrew alphabet aleph bet gimel dalet hey and so on but what's more interesting is each section i said has eight verses a piece each section, the beginning line, the beginning word of each verse is that letter. So the first eight verses of the psalm all begin with the letter A, or Aleph. The next eight verses all begin with the letter Bet, right? On down through the psalm. You can't translate it like that. You can translate the meaning, and we know what the meaning is, but there's just no way, I mean... I'd love to see the person who could pull that off, but there's just no way you're going to get it from Hebrew where it can start with these letters and, and put it into English and it mean the same thing. So it's not as if we don't know what the Bible's telling us, but we are missing, in at least this case, something of the artistry that's involved. And then I would say in other cases, there are some shades of meaning that we miss. There are allusions that we miss, but that's you can get that sort of thing through commentaries sometimes. The commentator will point this out to you. So a lot just depends on what you're trying to do, I think. Uh, I saw another question that says, uh, oh, let me just say this too. I put in the chat box, Pastor Anthony's YouTube channel. He has about 14,000 subscribers. If you guys, he wouldn't, maybe he wouldn't tell you this, but recently he went viral for absolutely destroying uh, Brandon Tatum, who is a political uh, commentator uh, on YouTube, but he debated Brandon Tatum on the Trinity. Uh, Brandon Tatum invited people to just come in and, and pass. <laughs> and, and so he he just absolutely exploded. And uh, he's debated uh, Shabir Ali, who's considered one of the great world's greatest uh, Muslim polemicists or, or apologists. And so you can support him. You can subscribe to his channel. It's in the chat. Also, the Patreon, you can give anywhere from a dollar, uh, I think, all the way on up. Uh, I'm going to subscribe to be a Patreon tonight. If you can see Pastor Anthony, he just he has the love of God and the love of God's word. And he's really what he studies. This is rich. This is substantive. And he just he just doesn't care about, about giving it away for free. And that's what you see on his channel when he goes live. It's substance. Like when you when you listen to him, you're going to get some substance. You're going to walk away with a, with a headache because your brain has exploded inside of your skull uh, because of the things that he, he said. So if you if y'all are interested, me personally, I support apologetic ministries. That's something I've been I've been doing have become to do. I, I say this is what we need as the body of Christ. And so I'm really supporting apologetic ministries. And I would admonish uh, you guys to do the same. His Patreon link is in the comments. And so the next question is, I see the angel of the Lord and the angel of God used. Is it fair to say that these are the same being or are they separate? Yeah, it's the same person. So if you look at the, I mentioned answeringislam.org, where I have a series of articles. So if you go there, I, I think it's the first article that, that deals with 
this as an interchangeable term for the angel of the Lord. And this is another example where the Hebrew is helpful, uh, at least in, I mean, you could observe this in the English text, but uh, this kind of stands out in Hebrew. And uh, what what's interesting is, remember I said, read closely. Um, you will never see the phrase angels of the Lord. Okay. That's never, that's never used. It's never angels of the Lord in the plural. That always is used in the singular. It refers to a specific figure. You'll see angels, right? But not angels of the Lord, that phrase. Because in Hebrew, when you have uh, two nouns in, in construct, if the second noun in construct means they're two nouns put together uh, and the second noun is a proper noun, then it makes the whole statement definite. It means, in other words, not an angel, but the, right? So it has to mean the angel of the Lord because Jehovah or Yahweh, the divine name, is a proper noun. So it's always the angel of the Lord. And so if you were to use the plural, then it would, it would be a problem because it would suggest the divinity of these figures and it would obscure the distinction between this figure and, and ordinary angels. So you never have that phrase in the plural. On the other hand, you do have angels of God used, and that's because there's a different construction going on here. In the case of uh, that phrase, when you have the plural, uh, well, if, if you want to say the angel of God in Hebrew, you do need the definite article now, okay? because the word God is not a proper name. And so when it's talking about the angel of the Lord, it uses the definite article, the angel of God. When it uses the plural, it drops the definite article. Okay, so, I mean, it's just fascinating. There's this consistency across the Bible where this figure stands out. The angel of God is a way of distinguishing him from angels of God and identifying him as the angel of the Lord. And in, in, in fact, you know, some cases the text will simply say God appeared in other cases it will say the angel of God, just like you see with the angel of the Lord. So yeah, there, check out that article. I give all the references for that. Uh, it's the same figure and there's all kinds of evidence for that. Okay. Well, we passed answer. Do, do you have time for one more question or two, one or two more questions or? Yeah. Does anyone have a question? I do. I'm, tr I'm trying to let you guys ask. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, now I'm, I'm getting ready to geek out, so y'all have to pardon me. So, Pastor Pastor Rogers, I've I've been reading uh, because you know I follow I follow you, and I've read uh, be because of you. You entered one of the books. You entered introduced uh was two powers in heaven and uh i believe alan siegel and so then when i read genesis 16 and i read uh, exodus 34 so in two powers in heaven power speaks about the angel who who is seen sitting uh in the talmud and it and he 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 lists like the different rebukes of this angel, and and their response was that, uh, you know, one of the one of the uh, the menim they they said they went uh, they had this experience, uh, this vision of heaven, and they went to heaven and, and he saw an angel sitting down in God's courtroom, and according to the their their uh, tradition, you didn't sit down in the presence of God. Only God was, you know, sitting down on the throne. And so apparently this guy, when he got back, uh, he, he was rebuked for, for saying that he saw this angel sitting down and he was said to have been kicked out and his name was changed to like the other or, or something, something Ahir. strange. Like Ahir, the, right? A -H -E -R. Ahir, right? A-H-E-R. Uh, and he was kicked out. And then they said in the Talmud, they said in heaven, there is no sitting. There is no this. There is no this. But he said there are, there is no backs. There are no backs. That angels don't have backs. And 
I remember reading Siegel, and Siegel was was wrestling. Why would they mention backs? What is the significance of backs? So these connections begin to tie in my head because Hagar in Genesis, doesn't she say, I have seen the back of the one who sees me? Yeah, and the literal, yeah. Back, and, and then what does God tell Moses? He says, I'm not going to show you my face because you can't see my face and live. I'm going to show you my back. And then he passes by, he shows, and Moses sees the back. And so I'm looking at the Talmud, I'm looking at Hagar, and I'm looking at, at Moses. And what's so interesting about that, that, uh, that section of Exodus to me is that God says, I'm going to come down and proclaim my name to you. And I was thinking, why would God need to proclaim his own name? So I went to the Targums, and in the Targums, the Targum, one of the Targums has, has Moses proclaiming God's name. They were so embarrassed about, about God coming down and proclaiming his own name. It, it demonstrated to me that this was something at least uncomfortable, even to the, to the, uh, to the Targumists, for, because they put the proclamation of God's name in Moses' mouth. So I, I was just wondering, what, what, is, what, is there something there? Is there, there, is there, there, there? <laughs> or am well, I just... I, I don't know. I do think that those connections are evoked i mean i do think there's something to that i don't pretend to know the full explanation as far as like why they would say angels don't have backs or something like that i mean the whole notion to me strikes me as as curious as i mean you can't have a front without a back right i mean there's just it's so i'm not really sure i'm not really sure what that's all about but you do have this fact that god's back is referred to in scripture at least theophanically right ultimately god doesn't have a back but he does assume visible appearance he appears to angels and saints in heaven uh to people on earth and his back does take some significant role in these encounters they they encounter god's back his receding glory in fact here's what i i was going to say though when you mention god appearing to moses god god saying you know you can't see my face and live i'll pass by you right i'll put you in the cleft of the rock i'll pass by you you'll you'll see my back or receding glory and so forth it's interesting in the new testament when jesus in in mark 6 there's this statement that you see commentators just stumbling over and missing uh the disciples are out in the boat and going across and they're struggling at the oars. We're told that the wind was against them and so forth, and, and, and they just can't get across the ocean or the sea. And Jesus comes walking to them on the sea, and then it says that Jesus intended to pass by them. And when you read that, a lot of people think it's like Jesus, you know, here's the disciples, they're being tossed around by the wind in the boat, and Jesus is just strolling on the waters and just going to walk right by them. Well, what you find out is, I mean, you, you pay attention to the text and, and it goes on to say uh, at the end of the account, it talks about them being amazed. And then it says, because they did not understand uh, when he, you know, the incident of the loaves. So what it's what it's saying is it's pointing back to a previous instance incident and it says they didn't get it. That's why they're puzzled here. Right. That's why they're not getting it here. And that's why Jesus is doing what he's doing here. They, they miss the point of Jesus feeding, think about it, a multitude of Israelites in the wilderness miraculously. Think, you know, what, what, what does that suggest? They're, you know, these are the people of God. God fed the people of Israel in the wilderness, right? The people that he delivered from the sea, right? The, the, the Israelites. So here's Jesus. He feeds a multitude of people in the wilderness. The disciples don't get it. So Jesus puts them on a boat. He remains on land. He prays while they're out there struggling all night uh, at the oars being tossed around by the wind. And then it says he intended to pass by them. The idea is that Jesus, in light of their blindness, their hardness of heart, is intentionally orchestrating this situation so that he can reveal himself to them. He's going to pass by them. And what does he do in the course of this? when he goes to pass by them, it says he revealed his name to them, right? He says, 
Uh, it says they thought they saw a ghost, and Jesus said, "Do not be afraid. I am in the literal Greek, ego in me. Right? Take courage." So, uh, and then when you look at Isaiah 40 through 55, you have this whole section of the prophet Isaiah, which is the New Exodus section, where he's talking about God doing a greater thing than he did when he delivered the people from Egypt. In Isaiah 43, when it's talking about the future, God says that uh, he's going to be with his people when they pass through the waters. He's going to deliver them. And then he says, therefore, do not be afraid. And at least twice in that same context, he calls himself, I am, right? So Isaiah 43, you have this conjunction of God saying, don't be afraid, I am, and promising to, to be with his people when they pass through the waters. In Mark 6, Matthew 14, John 6, the parallel accounts, Jesus rescues the disciples from the sea, declares his name to them, I am, and says, do not be afraid. Right? I mean, there, there's all this interweaving going on. All that was just my long-winded way of saying not really sure what's going on with angels not having backs. I do think there's something to the fact that uh, God's back is mentioned prominently in certain places. Um, so I, and, I, I, and, I just thought and, about it. Uh, I just one thing about to, it. Oh, okay. I, I, oh. I'll, I'll say this because I didn't put this in context for you. I just thought about it. Sometimes I think I don't, I don't give people the entire picture that's in my head. So, I was thinking about this concept uh, and just wondering, based off of Isaiah, I took the, the concept of the arm of the Lord and how, how it says that the arm of the Lord uh, will, uh, 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 you, you, you really pointed this out, how the prophecy, Isaiah 53, uh, who, whom has the Lord, God, uh, the arm of the Lord, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And this notion that the Messiah was called the arm of the Lord. And I was thinking that maybe this was a Jewish way of talking about the Godhead. So because a person's figuratively speaking, your arm is a part of you. And so when I saw that, as I began to read these, these different notions about the back, I went back to Hagar. And the person, the, Moses says that who she saw was the angel of the Lord. Well, now, if this angel of the Lord is also by Hagar being said, called, I saw the back of the one who, who, who sees me. Because uh, uh, supposedly he was, probably wasn't just facing away from her. <laughs> or even if he was, then that would be consistent with uh, not, you can't see my face and live. Uh, but so I was just, I was saying, is this, could this be the ancient Jewish way of indicating that this, this person, this was a divine person who was distinct from, from the father. That was, that was my idea. Something definitely to explore. Um, could be some idiomatic thing, uh, something else there. Yeah. Uh, one, one thing I was going to say when you mentioned this, if I'm not mistaken, if, if it's not this one, this, this is still relevant to bring up, though, is that you mentioned that the, the person mentions going to heaven, having one of these these visions that included the angel of the Lord. This is the Targum, excuse me, not the Targums, the Talmud. This is rabbinic, post-Christian. The Targums represent Second Temple Judaism before the, the Talmud. In fact, the Talmud uh, suppresses all talk of the Memra. You'll never find any reference to the word of the Lord, the Memra, in the in the Talmud. Now this idea is dangerous, right? We can't be talking about the word of the Lord like the earlier Jews did. So you know that this isn't the creation of the Talmudic Jews. It has to be other Jews, earlier Jews. But anyways, uh, in the Talmud, they're trying to account for the figure, the angel of the Lord, and so they do different things with him. They're also trying to answer people who say there's a second divine person, two powers in heaven. And uh, in some of these visions, uh, these people see this figure, the angel of the Lord, which they call Metatron, saying or doing things that strikes them as blasphemous. So that can only be said about God. But if I'm not mistaken, the one who's called other, the one who does this is Rabbi Akiva. 
Now, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's him in this case, but I know that he did at one point advocate this according to the Talmud. And the reason that's significant, okay, so there, the, the Talmud is trying to deal with this earlier Jewish idea. Now, a lot of people will say, no, they're dealing with Christians who are saying this sort of thing. The problem is when you look at the Talmud, it often attributes this error to Jews. Okay, so Rabbi Akiva is said to have said this about the angel of the Lord, which they considered blasphemous, right? And then so they call him Aher, other, right? Um, because he has a vision that gives countenance or credence to this notion of his divinity, right? If he's seated in heaven like God is, then, you know, it, it, it suggests that the two powers heresy is correct. So at one point, apparently, according to the Talmud, Rabbi Akiva held this view. Rabbi Akiva is not just any rabbi. He was considered the greatest rabbi of the Talmudic period. Okay, So this, this position was so strong that it even persuaded, according to the Talmud, at some point, Rabbi Akiva. Now, uh, that also leads you to wonder if his alleged repentance uh, actually is true. You know, Maybe we'll get to heaven and see Rabbi Akiva there. <laughs> But no, I, I'm just saying that, you know, it's, it's, you know, we have this thing too, right? Christians do this thing. Darwin repented on his deathbed, right? We, we say stuff like that. There's no good evidence that Darwin repented, you know, hopefully for his sake he did, but there's not. We tell these apocryphal stories, right? Well, I don't know. I wouldn't put it past the Talmud, uh, Talmudic Jews to say, yeah, but Rabbi Akiva changed his mind later. You know, I don't know, but Final question, and, and then we'll ask you to pray us out if you don't mind. Uh, what Jewish or Hebrew literature do you recommend of Christians wanting to better understand Old Testament theology? Uh, well, it's it's difficult in some ways, and a lot of my insights uh, have been just like, pulled from different places and it's not easy to get that in one spot right and that's that's true for anything you you incorporate things and and you see connections that maybe this source didn't tell you about but because you you know you can learn two separate things it doesn't mean you came up with them you learned them from two other places but these two places may not have made the connection and you make the connection or and there's just a lot of stuff like that i'll run across things in jewish works Sometimes it's not until somebody raises an issue that I realize I know an answer to something that I, I didn't even know the question, right? Uh, and so there's just stuff like that. And uh, there are some Christians who are more informed about Jewish stuff than others, not necessarily telling you to go out there and get this. But if you look at some of the older commentators, one of the commentators that makes mention of Jewish stuff a lot is John Gill. Uh, John Gill, he's easily accessible. A lot of his stuff is online. When you look up commentaries on something, you see John Gill and he'll often bring up, you know, Rabbi so-and-so said this and this Jewish guy said that. And, and it's not like he's just going to Jews for his interpretations. Sometimes he's disagreeing with them, right? He's just giving something of the history of interpretation. And, um, but uh, sometimes I, you know, I, I learn stuff in commentaries. Sometimes I, I learn it in reading books that are interacting with Jews. Sometimes I get it from Jewish works. Um, the Targums are, I think, pretty useful for a number of things. Um, they're, a lot of them are available online. They're pretty expensive to buy in hard copies. Um, I mean, like just one, I'll, I'll show you one, in, in fact, <laughs> real quick. Uh, uh, just, just because I want you to get an idea of how expensive they're charging you for this. So this is, uh, which one is this? Targum Neophyte on Genesis, and it's about that thick, not too thick. Um, and I think this was around 80 bucks, right? So that's pretty expensive, but you can go online. You can't get Targum Neophyte, but you can get, um, I mean, it might be online eventually, but there are other Targums. There's, there's more than one Targum. There's Targum Pseudo Jonathan, the Targum of Ankalos. Those are all online. Uh, I think it's Targum.info has these online, some of them. Um, so you can read that sort of thing. 
Uh, there are different midrashes, which are very useful, like Genesis Rabbah, Exodus Rabbah, those sorts of things. But, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, I, you know, I'm not necessarily recommending that people just go out and get just Jewish works per se, as much as the, the one thing I think is really useful is, is a lot of stuff where you've got Jewish people engaging unbelieving Jews because they've spent a lot of time in Jewish writings. And sometimes, you, and you know this from your own reading, when you read a book, if they mention a book, then you say, oh, I want to get that. So when you read this stuff, you might come across something and say, hey, that sounds like something that might be useful beyond the point they made. Um, but I remember, for example, I've done a lot of stuff on what I call the New Exodus. Other people call it that too. And the, the idea is that the original Exodus is uh, typical of points to redemption through Christ. And this is an important motif, and it, 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 it helps you inestimably in your interpretation of the New Testament when you realize this, right? Uh, give you a quick illustration here. Uh, I think Mark's gospel is, is identifying Jesus as the, the, the leader of the New Exodus. He is the Lord uh, who's come to rescue his people. So it's not surprising when in Genesis, or excuse me, Mark 5, um, Jesus, uh, or excuse me, Mark 4, I was thrown off, I'm thinking, that doesn't work. Mark 4, in Mark 4, Jesus rescues his disciples from the sea. He does this twice in Mark, but Mark 4, he rescues the disciples from the sea. Uh, he rebukes the winds and the waves. Rebukes is the term that's used for it, which is the same phraseology the Psalms used to talk about God delivering the people of Israel from the sea at the Exodus. He rebuked the sea, right? So it not only talks about Jesus delivering them from the sea, it uses Old Testament language <clears throat> used for God when he did that. Uh, then following that, in Mark 5, Jesus delivers the, uh, excuse me, the, the Gerasene demoniac from a legion of demons. What is a legion? A legion was a military unit. It, it's used to refer to uh, troops right? Soldiers and so forth. So you have Jesus delivering the disciples from the sea, then destroying a legion of Satan's hosts, drowning them in the sea. What happened at the Exodus? God delivered the people from the sea, then he drowned Pharaoh's armies, legions, in the sea. This is followed in uh, Mark 6 with Jesus then feeling, feeding a multitude of Israelites in the wilderness. So you have sea deliverance, deliverance from Satan's forces, followed by wilderness feeding. And then it's repeated, okay? Then again, you have another sea deliverance from Jesus, followed by Jesus defeating one of Satan's minions who's inhabiting a girl, followed by another feeding miracle. And then all of this is followed by Jesus leading his disciples up a mountain. Remember what happens when God delivers the people from Egypt through the wilderness, he takes them to Mount Sinai. Moses and three people go up the mountain. Jesus takes three people up the mountain. Uh, Peter, James, and John. But what's interesting, now here, here's a connection. If you go back to Exodus, this is one of the two powers texts that the Talmudists are trying to deal with. One of my problems, by the way, is I, I start talking about stuff and then I forget what the question I was addressing was. But uh, Exodus 24.1, listen to this statement carefully. This is God speaking to Moses. He says, come up the mountain to the Lord. Okay. That's how he addresses Moses. Anything curious about that stand out to you? Why does God say to Moses, come up the mountain to the Lord? Why doesn't he say, come up the mountain to me? And then we're told that God descends on the mountain, the cloud is there, right? And, and, and they see God and so forth. So it seems to be from the first verse that the Lord is talking about somebody else on that mountain. If you read the immediately preceding context, Exodus 23, God tells Moses, I'm going to lead you into the land. I mean, uh, I'm going to lead you through the wilderness, right? Uh, by, uh, he says, I'm going to send my angel ahead of you. And then he says, don't rebel against him. Listen to him is the literal Hebrew. Listen to him. He will not pardon your transgression my, because my name is in him. Okay, so this angel bears his very name, and therefore they are to listen to him. It's immediately after that that God says to Moses, come up the mountain to the Lord. 
Who's the Lord? In context, it's the one who bears his name, right? Now, now, now go back to the Gospels. In the Gospels, Jesus delivers the disciples from the sea. In Mark 6, then he delivers a girl from the, uh, one of Satan's troops. Then he feeds a multitude of Israelites in the wilderness. Then in Mark 9, he leads three of the disciples up the mountain. God the Father descends in the cloud, and what does he say about Jesus? This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. And by the way, who appears? Who appears on that occasion? There's two Old Testament figures from Israel's past. Moses. For Moses, this was all deja vu, right? I've been here before. <laughs> the other figure is Elijah. What do you think ties Elijah to Moses that would make him also fit to appear with him on this mountain? If you look at 2 Kings, Elijah flees at one point, and he ends up at Mount Sinai after he has this great showdown with the prophets of Baal and so forth. Shows up at Mount Sinai, and guess who shows up? the angel of the Lord, right? The angel of the Lord appears on Sinai to uh, Elijah. So, I mean, uh, I don't remember what question I was answering. but <laughs> uh, Oh, oh, so I, I know what it was. I, so I was saying that here's this Exodus mo motif re occurring, reoccurring over and over again. And the real Exodus is Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, and I'm not going to make connect the dots here, but all of this is pointing to Jesus as the author of the original Exodus, who's come again now to accomplish the true Exodus, the true deliverance of God's people from spiritual bondage, from Satan, from his hosts, uh, from death, sin, the grave, all of that, passing through the waters of death, right? Jesus said, can you be baptized with the baptism with which I'm going to be baptized? He's referring to his death as a baptism. The Israelites were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Right. There's all this connection that's going on. Anyways, um, I w when I read rabbinic work, sometimes these pearls are scattered far between. You know, you read all this stuff and you'd be like, not sure how helpful that is. <laughs> but then I run across these nuggets. And, and there's one I saw not long ago where, where a Jewish person in, in Exodus Rabbah says, as it was at the original Exodus, so it shall be in the future Exodus. And then it quotes Malachi 3.1, Behold, I'll send my messenger ahead of me who will prepare my way. Uh, and then the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant uh, whom you, in whom you delight is coming, declares the Lord. Notice he's called the messenger of the covenant. In Hebrew, that's Melach Ha-Borit, angel of the covenant. The Lord who's coming is the angel of the covenant. Right? So... Uh, I don't know that I have a, a just, you know, read this Jewish work and you're going to be inestimably blessed by this. It's more like read a hundred Jewish works and you'll find some nuggets. <laughs> uh, read good, good Christian works that draw out these nuggets for you. And you might say, hey, I want to read the whole thing. I don't know. Uh, you know, you, you, you're certainly not going to be getting Christian theology. And some of it you're going to be saying this. This just looks wild, uh, you know, uh, Anyways, well, uh, just wanted to acknowledge again we had uh, Mr. Ron Woodruff, the uh, director of Reasonable Faith, uh, Collin County, and we had uh, Mr. K.S. was 